speaker for, hard to believe, 15 years. And I would say there's probably not a single political, international security, or brand strategy issue I haven't had a fundamental disagreement with him. <laughs> that doesn't mean we're not the dearest of friends and colleagues, because the fact is we are. Um, actually working with McCubin Owens in the National Security Decision Making Department of War College, it makes me, it reminds me of what a, it was a privilege to be a part of that department. Uh, it was a diverse group of scholars, professors. Um, he's obviously a scholar. He's a scholar of the Civil War, obviously of Abraham Lincoln. When I was speaking with Mac before the presentation, I said, well, surely you'll be speaking about President Obama, uh, because there's all these parallels. And he said, of course it will be. But I'll also be speaking about President Bush as well. One of the reasons why that was important for me to hear that is my own myopia. I think of Obama and Lincoln, but the truth is these challenges in times of war are what every commander uh, faces. And what Abraham Lincoln can still offer us as lessons, inspiring lessons today. Uh, so I won't go on much longer. Uh, but I do need to mention. Uh, just again, we're both lovers of the Greek language, and I just read Max recent piece in the Wall Street Journal all bit about the don't ask, don't tell policy, so I know we'll having this spirited debate later on this evening about Eros versus Philia and this policy. That's not really the basic point. There is something extremely important you should know about. Um, he's not just a scholar, he's an American hero. Uh, as an infantry platoon commander in Vietnam, he was wounded twice and received the Silver Star, uh, which is the third highest award one can receive in combat under fire for gallantry. Um, so it's an honor and a privilege to welcome my dear friend and colleague, Matt Collins. I think you're on right now. Am I on? You're wired. Can you hear me? Hear me now? Uh, I'm not technological. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, I uh, I did enjoy my time with uh, with Peter. We, we we did debate on just about everything, but that's okay. That's uh, that's fine. That's the way uh, scholarly endeavor should be. I do uh, need to mention something, of course, that uh, Peter retired from the Air Force. And there was a time when our hair was about the same length. <laughs> that's not quite true because I was a Marine, he was the Air Force, but you know what I'm talking about. Well, Peter decided he was going to let his hair grow, ponytail and things like that. So I decided I'd shave my head. And so I guess the idea is there's only so much hair in the universe, and I'm just we're trying to keep this in balance. So, anyway, that's, uh, uh, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to, to be here. When I first got here in 1987, I taught some courses here at Salve as an adjunct uh, uh, economic courses for the most part. Uh, so I've actually been in this building before teaching you know, see, intermediate microeconomics and intermediate macroeconomics and so forth, all these wonderful things like that. I, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak about, uh, about Lincoln. I do need to say a couple of things about Lincoln, of course, is I did not start out to be a Lincoln man in the sense that uh, I was born in Texas. My entire family fought for the Confederacy. Uh, I did spend much time in, in Texas. I was in the Marine Corps, my dad was in the Marine Corps. But I call, I come from something called a lost cause household. Now, the lost cause, of course, is what they, they talk about, the Southern lost cause. And uh, sort of the mythology of the South. And I, you know, I, I, I knew the arguments. I knew them by heart, I knew them and so forth. But, at some point, I, uh, I had the uh, occasion to uh, have a discussion with a fellow named Harry Goffin. 
I didn't know anything about Harry at the time. I did not realize when we first talked that he had forgotten more about Abraham Lincoln and the American founding than most people know. But he, uh, he set me straight on a couple of things. And, and since that time, of course, I figured that maybe my understanding of the Civil War was wrong, and maybe my understanding of Lincoln was a little wrong, and I was right that I was wrong. And so I since corrected my, uh, my, my approach here. So uh, again, again, I would take this up. But, uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, Talk about Lincoln. Uh, last year, as you know, was the bicentennial of Lincoln's birth, and in conjunction with that, I, I published a, uh, a monograph with the uh, Foreign Policy Research Institute on Lincoln as a war president. Now, the interesting thing about that was that I'd originally written the paper several years earlier, and what had happened, and this gets to an interesting point, is that all the books and articles about Abraham Lincoln. Very little has been written on him as a war president. Which is interesting when you think about it, because he's probably the only president in American history whose entire time in office was defined by a war. Yet, you know, you know, 5,000 new books uh, uh, during the uh, bicentennial period, and you know, not that much really on him as, as a war president. And so, what had happened here was that uh, they had a, this group had a, a conference. And they had a lot of top nine scholars, and they <coughs> published a book. After they got down with the, uh, with the conference, somebody said, you know, really, uh, we're missing something. We don't have anything on Lincoln as war president. So after the fact, they asked me to write down the, the, the article, which I did. For a variety of reasons, it never, no, the book never panned up. So what I was able to do was take this essay and expand it into a monograph and take advantage, of course, last year's uh, of the uh, bicentennial, but also the fact that the uh, the fact that the comparisons between uh, between Abraham Lincoln and uh, then Senator now President Obama, and uh, so I was able to uh, take advantage of that situation. The uh, fact is that uh, and again, as I say, there's only about four books that I can point to out of the vast literature about about Abraham Lincoln that deal with him as a war president. Two of them are over 50 years old. Another one came out about five years ago, and to tell you the truth, it's not very good. And last year was, of course, James McPherson tried by war, which is excellent. But in many respects, you don't learn that much more about Lincoln's war president there than you would uh, from uh, uh, Battle Cry of Freedom, which, of course, is his is, is, is greatest uh, work. So what I want to try to do is to talk uh, about Lincoln in the context of uh, being a war president. and. Um, a few of these things, and if you look at this list, uh, a lot of these things are contemporary. The fact is that re republics at war face certain problems. And we have to deal with them. Abraham Lincoln had to deal with them. FDR had to deal with them. President Bush had to deal with them. And President Obama has to deal with them. And so uh, you know, one, another way of looking at it is you can say that when 9-11 uh, happened, George Bush could look back to FDR and Lincoln. In 1941, 1940, 1941, FDR could look back to Lincoln. Lincoln did not have anybody to look back to. Because what happened in, in this time was, uh, was unprecedented. Uh, when he was nominated in March of 1861, seven states had already seceded from the Union, or said they had. Of course, Lincoln's view was they never left the Union. They were in rebellion. And uh, sometimes I need to re remind my old uh, Lost Cause folks that the original name of this war was not the Civil War. It was the War of Rebellion. And, uh, and Lincoln's uh, philosophy, basically, philosophy of government, his understanding of government was very much based on the idea that those states never left the Union. And we can talk about later, that created some problems with him in terms of what he could do in terms of uh, trying to put this rebellion down. There are certain steps that he took that would, for instance, uh, imply that the Confederacy was belligerent status, which changed uh, the situation in international law. But these are the sorts of things, I think, that when you're talking about uh, the whole idea of what's the executive power? What about civil liberties during, uh, you know, during, uh, during, during the time of, of, of crisis? And what about uh, 
you know, what does it basically mean to, uh, um, to, to, be, to be the commander in chief, to be the president, and to uh, get, uh, to try to make strategy and implement strategy in the one. Now, the war itself began on April 12th, uh, 1861, in Charleston Harbor, Fort Sumter. And after this period of time, it be basically Lincoln called for 75,000 troops. When he did that, four more states seceded. And he was faced at this time with a full-blown uh, rebellion. And then he had to deal with this whole situation. Now, um, a couple of things that uh, we can start off by saying is that let's look at the, the individuals themselves. You look at uh, Abraham Lincoln on the one hand and Jefferson Davis on the other, and just on paper you say, who's going to be the more effective war leader? Well, there's old Jefferson Davis. You know, he's a West Point graduate. He's a, he, uh, he's a hero of the Mexican War, battle back to Buena Vista. He's been Secretary of War to Franklin Pierce, and he has been the Chairman of the Senate uh, uh, Military Affairs uh, <coughs> Committee. He ran Lincoln. Well, he was a captain in the militia in the Black Hawk War. He never saw any combat. And then later he served one term as, uh, as, as a congressman from, from uh, Illinois, where he created a, a lot of uh, problems, I think, for himself and probably for the Whig Party as opposing the Mexican War and constantly asking James Polk to describe the actual point where the Mexicans attacked the Americans. So, you know, if you look at the two individuals and say, okay, which one of these is going to be the more effective commander, you'd have to say that it would be, it would be dangerous. Now this is a quote, this is, a, this is Lincoln making fun of himself in Congress in 1848. Now the election of 1848 pitted the Whig candidate, uh, Zachary Taylor, who was of course one of the successful generals of the Mexican War, against a fellow named Lewis Cass of Michigan. And uh, Lewis Cass had, had served really a really long time ago in the militia in the War of 1812. And so what the Democrats were trying to do at this point was to turn Lewis Cass into a military hero. And so here's Lincoln you know, making fun of himself to in fact make fun basically of Lewis Cass in this whole situation. In fact, my favorite line of this, a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes. And although I never fainted from loss of blood, I can say that I was, was uh, frequently very hungry. So, you know, this is, a, this, this is a sort of situation, you look at Abraham Lincoln and you recognize that uh, he had certain characteristics and, and traits of character, I think, that you will see later on, I think, that made him a better uh, commander during the war. Now, one of the problems that a republic faces is this sort of clash between vigilance on the one hand and responsibility on, on the other. You see that today in the whole debate about the Patriot Act and some of these other things about are we protecting our civil liberties or are we concerned about security? And the fact is we have to balance the two. And uh, you, you see here uh, from two of the founders, the Ken's basically of, of, uh, of Jefferson there, who is talking about vigilance. <coughs> the people have to watch out, they have to make sure that the government is not overstepping its bounds. And then you see uh, basically the response from, uh, from uh, from Hamilton, where he talks about the fact that under certain circumstances, in times of emergency, that the powers of maintaining security have to essentially be unlimited. Now that's, you know, you know these are the two guys at the beginning of the, of the Republic who, who clashed on so many different things. But you see, these, these are perfectly legitimate questions, but perfectly legitimate positions. And the fact is that we as a, as a country and our leaders have to balance these two. Of course, it's always going to be, some people are going to disagree. As a matter of fact, probably at any point, everybody's going to disagree. Some people have gone too far, some people we haven't gone far enough. This is another situation, basically, uh, you know, this is one of my favorites, basically, is melancholy reflection that liberty should be equally exposed to danger, whether the government has, they use the poem that these have too much or too little power. And then Lincoln, 
talking right, right after the firing on Fort Sumter. Is there in all republics this inherent and fatal weakness? Must the government of necessity be too strong for the liberties of its own people or too weak to maintain its own existence? There's your dilemma. There's your, your, your basic problem that republics face. As I say, Lincoln faced it in 1861, and we face it again today. And we can expect to as, as long as emergencies continue. Now, um, one of the, the, what I would like to point out here is that um, you've probably seen him on television, um, Major, retired Major General uh, Bob Scales. And he said on one occasion that the, the main thing in war is to make sure that the main thing remains the main thing. And he's talking about the importance of the objective, make sure that the objective is always main in sight. And for Lincoln, that was fairly simple. And everything else was subordinated to it. Now, this is a famous, uh, quote from a letter that he sent to, uh, to Horace Greeley, the publisher of the uh, editor and publisher of the New York Tribune. And it, it again laid out the, the point here that his overarching concern was to restore the union. And that he would take whatever steps were necessary to do that. Now, remember this time, there was a lot of disagreement about the whole issue of how Far should the country go in terms of attacking the institution of slavery? And Lincoln's concern at the beginning was that you know, we're going to do this fairly slowly, try to entice the South back in. Plus, he was faced with another issue, which is that four slave states remained within the Union. And so this, uh, this created all sorts of problems for him in terms of uh, what he was able to do. And there's another thing which everybody, nobody knows is the fact that in 1861, the federal government had no authority over the institution of slavery where it existed. Slave states decided whether it was slave states or not. The federal government had no power to, to affect that. Lincoln and the president, the president that he pointed to, suggested that the government, the federal government, could prohibit the expansion of slavery. And this was really, in many cases, it wasn't about abolishing slavery where it existed. It was about the expansion of slavery that led to the, uh, the South leaving the Union. But this is, a, you know, this, this is an important point. Here. And of course, we'll talk about this a little later when I talk about emancipation, because uh, this is often misunderstood. His argument here was that, look, we, we need to protect Republican government. Because, again, we look at the time there were no other republics in the world at this time. There were countries moving toward in a liberal direction, but the United States was the only was the only republic. And part of the argument, of course, was that if the uh, if Republican government could not survive in North America, it couldn't survive anywhere. And that's why uh, uh, Lincoln at one point called the United States uh, the last best hope of Earth, and he felt it was important to him to uh, to, to maintain the union. Now, a way of looking at it is that if uh, the Union had not been restored, if the Confederacy had, in fact, achieved its independence, then you would have had no control, no ability to eventually abolish slavery. And I think that was a lot of Lincoln's reasoning during this period of time. Now, one of the arguments uh, I always make with regard to Lincoln as a, a president in general, but as a war president in particular, is that he was characterized, his actions were characterized by prudence. And uh, prudence is a virtue, Aristotle calls it the virtue most necessary for the statesman. And that's the ability to reason properly about the means. <coughs> the end is in sight, the end is fixed. And how do you achieve the end? What means do you use? What reasoning do you bring to bear? And in general, the principle which sounds backwards is to say you need to adapt the universal principle to the particular circumstances. Now, when I'm an audience like this, I can explain it by reference to tactic and sailing. Now, when I go to Ohio and tell, I tell people about tacking, you know what the hell I'm talking about, okay? But you know, the fact is, if you're going to sail from Newport to, uh, to, uh, to Jamestown, that's why you want to do that, I don't know, but if you're going to, you can't get there from here. You have to tap. You have to adjust to the wind, to the, to the currents, and so forth. 
And in many respects, that's what, what prudence is. is uh, <coughs> that's the analogy I like to use for, for prudence. You know where you want to go, you need what you need to do. But now you have to decide the appropriate means under the circumstances. And I think if you look at Lincoln during his presidency, you see this constantly at work. I'll talk in a few minutes about many of the things that he had to balance. I mean, he had to balance <coughs> ethnic groups. He had to balance uh, the political parties. And uh, he had to do this in so many different ways. And the result was that the radical Republicans especially thought he was going too slowly, and the war Democrats thought he was going too fast. And uh, you know, so he had to choose very carefully in order to achieve his goal. Because if he had gone too far in one direction, it's very, very likely that, uh, that he, would have, uh, he would have failed. Now, an example of, uh, of the, the exercise of prudence is the whole idea of personnel. Everybody who's read uh, you know, Team of Rivals, I think it's an excellent book. So I highly recommend it if you haven't. But one of the things that Lincoln did, in addition to placing pretty much all his rivals for the Republican nomination in his cabinet, was to also bring in other people, Democrats, especially Edwin Stanton, who was the second Secretary of War. In order to maintain this, what we call a working coalition, that was necessary for him to prevail in the war. And this working coalition depended particularly on the moderate Republicans and the so-called war Democrats. That is, the Democrats who were lukewarm about the abolition of slavery, but at the same time wanted to restore the Union. Now, there are two other groups that, uh, that, that were at play. One was the radical Republicans. And uh, while they remained in the government for the most part, they made Lincoln's life miserable. Uh, you know, passing legislation, uh, but especially with something called the Joint Committee for the Oversight of the War. And the book on this was called Look Over Lincoln's Shoulder, because that's literally what they did. They constantly held hearings designed to embarrass him, to embarrass uh, certain generals and the like. It was very difficult to conduct part of those circumstances. The other group of peace Democrats, also known sometimes as the Copperheads, now, by 1863 and 1864, in some respects, they had crossed from, from dissent to active opposition. Every summer, I go out to uh, a place called Ashland, Ohio. I teach for a couple weeks out there in a master's program. I always remind my folks out there that a couple of, you know, only about 20 miles away from Ashland is a place called Mansfield. And in 1863, there was an arm, active armed resistance to uh, conscription to the draft. And of course, that wasn't the first thing that happened. So, so as you can see, Lincoln had to maintain the, the, the working coalition between the war Democrats and the, uh, and, the, and the moderate Republicans. And he had to do what he could with both of the other guys. The other uh, manifestation of his, of his uh, prudential understanding here was sort of the choice of generals. Now we hear so many bad things about, uh, about, uh, about political generals. There were some pretty bad ones, but there were some good ones too. And Lincoln had to worry about these sorts of folks. He had to worry that there are certain Democrats, uh, there are certain generals that the Democrats liked, like George McClellan. The Republicans hated. There were certain generals that the Republicans liked, like uh, John Pope. The Democrats hated him. The fact was he had to balance uh, his uh, his choices in, in making folks uh, and promoting folks. There was also the the issue of, of ethnic groups. The Germans, in particular, were staunch Republicans. So that accounts for people like Franz Siegel, one great general, or, uh, or, 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 or others. So I mean, this is a very difficult sort of situation, maintaining the coalition in the context, basically, of, uh, of, of groups that were all dissatisfied with how you were doing things. And it's not an easy decision to make. Now, as I said before, uh, in many respects, the civil, well, in all respects, the situation that Lincoln faced in 1861 was unprecedented. And so Lincoln basically went to the Constitution and said, okay, here is my war power. We know the, different, we know the, the Congress has a war power, and we know the executive uh, has a war power. And here's where, where he went. He went to, of course, Article 2. And it's a very important thing to note here, something called <coughs> executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States. 
you look at Article One of the Constitution about legislative power, it says all legislative power herein granted, which implies what? That some legislative power is not herein granted. Some of it's left to the states. But this is the elect, the executive power. And as I'll suggest later on, the executive power includes something that gives a certain amount of leeway to, to, the, to the president. The second part comes from, again, also uh, Section 1 of Article 2, that is his, his oath, his oath of office. Faithfully execute the office of the president of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. He also pointed to basically uh, Section 2 of Article 2, the Commander in Chief Clause. And then finally, to the, sex, the clause from Section 3, where he, that is the President, shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And this is it. Nobody had actually come close to having to face the situation that Lincoln did. Uh, to a certain extent, maybe James Polk during the Mexican War. But of course, that was not a domestic rebellion, which is the Civil War basically was. So, you know, based on this, here, here's some of the things he took after, uh, after Fort Sumner. Now, on his own authority, he could call out the militia. But he couldn't change the size of the Army and the Navy on his own. He couldn't expend funds for military purchases. Congress is out of session at this point. He could deploy military forces, but he couldn't blockade southern ones. And, of course, the big debate that he had with Joseph Taney is the whole issue of suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and the like. And, of course, the whole idea of the establishment of military tribunals, which, of course, is still with us today. Now, some of these, you know, some of these things, as I say, uh, he had to come back to Congress, which he did on July 4, 1861, and justify what he'd done, which he did. And Congress basically bought in at that point. And again, it gets to the idea that the president could have waited as the country fell apart, but instead he took steps and made the choice to come back later on and, to, and then uh, and explain himself. Now, this is something, uh, again, this is controversial, but one of the parts uh, is traditionally understood as part of the executive power is something called the prerogative. Now this comes, I mean, America's, America's philosopher, John Locke, who was an American, but if you look at American uh, political philosophy and the founding especially, uh, a lot of that is derived from the, from the uh, political philosophy of the uh, Locke defended the idea of republics against monarchies and so forth. But he did point out that under certain same circumstances, the executive has the authority, or actually the, the obligation, to act sometimes not only in the absence of the law, but sometimes in opposition, opposition to the law. And the reason for this is the law cannot foresee every emergency or exist exigency. And therefore, the executive must have the power and uh, the authority to take certain steps. Now, is this unlimited? I mean, is this making a dictator? Well, of course, there is always a limit. Uh, we, we have uh, ways in this country of getting rid of the executives that overstep the bounds. Uh, one way, of course, you know, before elections is called uh, impeachment. The other way, of course, is called elections. The fact is that you know this has been traditionally understood. Now, there's just lots of debate. How far does it extend? Uh, and of course, perhaps we can get into this in the, uh, in the question and answer. Now, this is uh, you know again, this is a quote from uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Thomas Jefferson, who. Basically, you know, he's kind of known as the, the pro civil liberties kind of guy. But what is he saying? He's saying basically that you know, a strict adherence to the to the law is a good thing most of the time. But sometimes something supersedes it. And he said at another time, he said, uh, you know, basically that uh, uh, in times of peace, the people look most to their representative, but in war, to the executive solely to give direction to their affairs with a confidence as suspicious as it is well-founded. Again, that's Jefferson, not, not Hamilton. That's Jefferson talking about things that can only be understood as being part of the prerogative. 
This is Lincoln himself. And this is she's talking about the whole idea of his decision to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in certain places in Maryland mm -hmm. on the railroads, rail routes uh, between Baltimore and uh, Washington D.C. because they've been attacked by a secessionist gang, the public ones, down there. And again, I mean, his argument here, you can see it. He said, uh, are all the laws but one to go unexecuted, and the government left itself to go to pieces, lest that one be violated? Even in such a case, would not the official oath be broken that the government should be overthrown when it was believed that disregarding the single law would tend to preserve it? Now, again, this is, a, this, is, this is prudence at work. You're not faced with a, this is a perfectly good idea, and this is a perfectly terrible idea. You focus. You, you're faced with, you know, questions of lesser evil. And I think that's what Lincoln was, was talking about. And prerogative permits, I, I think, the president to act like that, to act on that basis. Now, probably one of the most uh, controversial aspects of uh, Lincoln's war presidency is the uh, is the idea, basically, of civil liberty. Uh, uh, they were violent. There's no question about it. Uh, people were arrested. Newspapers were shut down. Uh, the writ of corpus was suspended on certain occasions. Uh, there were military tribunals that operated actually where civilian courts were still operating themselves. And as a matter of fact, after the war, um, the, the court steps in and basically says that we were not on, on improper. But at the time, uh, for, you know, in those days, the court mostly stayed out of uh, security affairs until after the emergency was over. But, uh, you know, there was an interesting situation, uh, an interesting uh, exchange between Lincoln and, uh, and a group of war Democrats who wrote him a letter, and they, they took issue with, uh, with some of the steps that he'd taken. And I call this to your attention. Everybody should read this. As a matter of fact, I went down, you know, back to about five years ago, when a similar situation was coming up, I, I suggested that George Bush ought to write a corning letter. And, and lay out exactly the same points that, that Lincoln has done here. And Lincoln is making the argument that the Constitution, during times of emergency, is different than the Constitution during peace time. And again, it gets back to this vigilance and responsibility. And again, it's based on proof, you have to understand it, and you can't, be, you can't abuse it. But his response here, I think, is, is, is very telling. And he, I, I like the argument down at the, 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 the bottom of it that to, to suggest that certain emergency powers have to be taken during peacetime is not to suggest that they can continue forever any more than it is to suggest that somebody's taking medicine when they're sick would continue to take that medicine when they're well. Now this uh, particular case involved a fellow named Blandingham, a congressman from Ohio, a cop copperhead, who in my regard is a traitor, but of course that's just me. Uh, the fact was he it had gone to some, uh, he was inciting uh, basically resistance to the, to, the, to the draft. Now Lincoln's treatment of this, uh, this whole situation is very, very nice. He's a lawyer, remember, he's a very good lawyer. And he lays out, he says, you Democrats say that you're in support of you know, winning the war and destroying the enemy. Uh, armies, I mean, uh, you know, that would require armies. Armies require men. And so the situation here is that we have uh, this fellow who's going around convincing people that sons ought to deserve or not enlist in the life. And then he uses this, uh, I don't have the quote exactly here, but he says, must I, must I shoot the, the simple-minded soldier boy and not touch a hair on the head of a wily captain? And, you know, I, I think that's, a, that's an interesting argument in this, this case. Now, the particular situation involved a fellow named Ambrose Burnside. The name ring a bell? Okay, I always, you know, always have to say that Rhode Islanders I have to thank God for Nathaniel Green, because otherwise, the best known military guy from, uh, from Rhode Island would be Ambrose Burnside. Anyway, I'm sorry, he wasn't exactly the best uh, example of, of, of leadership during the, uh, during the war. But uh, that's my little aside uh, with, uh, about that. But uh, again, th this, is a, th this is a tough issue. It continues to be a tough issue. Now, for a very long time, there was this idea that, uh, well, uh, Abraham Lincoln used to uh, would abuse the civil liberties all the time. The Confederacy was very, uh, you know, was very careful not to, to, to do that. And that's quite wrong. I mean, in fact, 
uh, both sides were republics, at least in their own minds, focused on trying to survive. And they both took steps that we today would consider to be uh, rather extreme. In the case of the Confederacy, a lot of it was extra legal. I don't know if you read the book or seen a movie, Cold Mountain, uh, but basically you had these home patrols that, that were responsible for you know, rousting out deserters and, and, and the like. Uh, there was also you know, a lot of, I'm going to say, extra legal, uh, extra legal uh, executions and so forth, which you did not have in, in, in the North. That's not to excuse either side, it is to say it's a typical problem. And again, it's also probably safe to say that uh, you know, this, these sorts of things went far beyond anything that we would do uh, in these days. Um, now, what about the sort of the military side of this? Okay. There's an argument that say, well, you know, Abraham Lincoln really didn't have anything to do with the Union victory. Just look at the, look at the disparity in terms of resources. On the one hand, you have this tremendous industrial power, and on the other hand, you have this sort of uh, you know, agricultural uh, uh, organization in the country. And the uh, you know Lincoln really didn't have anything to do with it. But in fact, Lincoln was instrumental in this because the, the fact is that resources don't organize themselves. Armies don't direct themselves. They need to be, somebody needs to have the ability to concentrate force, to mobilize the resources in life. And I think Lincoln did this reasonably well. As a matter of fact, uh, McPherson argues, and I agree, that, uh, that, that Lincoln was probably a better strategist than any of his generals. He understood things intuitively. Uh, too many of his generals, to the extent that they had military uh, expertise, were schooled in the uh, military art of the name uh, Jomini, who had a very mathematical, geometrical approach to, to war. Lincoln, even though it was not read by the Americans, was very much Klaus Fitchin, in the sense he understood the relationship between, between war, peace, and victory, and, and the like. And Lincoln taught himself. He, he spent hours reading the books and so forth. And he had particular understandings of what strategy was. Now this is a definition, Peter will recognize this because I actually wrote it in, the, in an article he used to use in the, uh, in the, uh, in the course over the day of War College. If you can't quote yourself, who the heck can you quote? So, uh, you know, the, these are, are, are three things basically that, that, that strategy does. You know, first of all, it links into means. Uh, second of all, it uh, you know helps to establish priority. If you think everything is equal, then nothing's equal. You know, you have to strategy by linking to resources basically says, okay, not to establish these priorities. I can't do everything at once. I have to do it in this order. And then finally, strategy permits you to to take raw resources and change it into the actual instruments. In the military sense, we're talking about divisions, fleets, and, and, and these sorts of things. Now, from a military standpoint, Lincoln's understanding was very clear. It's something that might be called concentration in time. You know, concentration in space is called basically massing your forces. Concentration in time is the idea that you move forces, separate forces, over different axes in order to, to ensure that your enemy cannot react. Now this would be a complete violation of sort of the Jovinian idea of concentration. Because it calls for you to operate on what were called external lines of operation. But you see that you see the logic here. The logic is that if, if you can move three armies or four armies or five armies, you will be able to prevent your opponent from shifting troops from one theater to another. Now Lincoln understood this intuitively. As a matter of fact, in, in early 1862, the, uh, appalled by the, by the lack of, uh, of movement on the armies, he issued an order, General Order 1, that said all armies will begin moving on Washington's birthday, two days ago. Of course, in wintertime, it really wasn't practical for everybody to do that. But the principle was there. In 1864, when Grant became commander-in-chief, and he, 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 he told 
uh, Lincoln what the plan was, which was to move five armies simultaneously. Lincoln's response was, just like we did in the West, if you're not skinning, you can hold a leg. And that was basically, you know, again, a country wide understanding of a very sophisticated uh, strategic uh, point in all of this. Uh, now, you know, strategy goes more uh, goes far beyond just being military strategy. It also includes the, the idea, basically, of, of uh, all the other instruments of power. And one of them, in this case, of course, was, was emancipation. As I say, at the beginning of the war, the focus was uh, not on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on, on interfering with slavery. But as time went on, we basically decided to do this. Now, there were several approaches that could be used. Lincoln's own approach was what is called gradual compensated emancipation. As I said before, the states determined what was a slave state or not. His idea was to go to the state legislature of these states, slave states, get them to abolish slavery, and go to Congress, get the money to compensate the, the slave owner. Now again, you know, we think slavery is a terrible thing, and it is. The fact was, that was probably, it would have taken time, but it probably would have been the least costly thing to do. Uh, there was also a martial law of emancipation, uh, which we'll put into phrase by people like, uh, like John Fremont in Missouri, or David Hunter in South Carolina. And Lincoln thought this was unconstitutional because it was done for political rather than military means. There was also a push on the part of especially the radicals to confiscate slaves. Now Lincoln believed that this was actually a violation of the, of the idea of the Constitution, the prohibition of a bill of attainer. The old dying days in, you know, in England, the, you know, the Duke of, of, uh, of Norfolk, uh, you, you attended him a trainer, and you, you seized his, uh, all of his, his land. But that bid was, bid was completely de de deprived of his heirs of their property. So you could punish the, the crime, but not the heirs. And the belief here was that confiscation would in fact do that. Contraband was another one. Contraband was actually started as a, as a, a very effective way of transferring manpower from the south to the north. But again, as a matter of law, it, it probably was not that work. So the final, uh, the, the final possibility was Lincoln's understanding of, of uh, Emancipation Proclamation as a war measure. Now, again, he faced some major problems here. One was the fact that, well, what do you do with the, the, the loyal state state? And uh, there was some concern that uh, he would lose the slave states if, in fact, he pursued it. Now, it turned out that he did, but there was a concern, there was a worry. This is uh, General Chief Halleck to Ulysses Grant talking about what this really meant. And this is important because what it did was to begin to shift manpower from the south to the north as the slaves first ran away and provided, you know, took labor away from the south and provided it to the north. But in the long run, it's also the case that it provided what Frederick Douglass called the Sable Army, that is, black troops. And by the end of the war, I mean, something of 180 to 200,000 uh, black troops served in the, uh, in the military. We've all seen the movie Glory, you know, well done movie, I think, for the most part. By the way, Matthew Robert looks exactly like Robert Gould Shaw. And it's not Ferris Bueller. Leading a regular civil war, he really did like that guy. Uh, but you know, this is basically the manpower that the uh, that the Union got out of this. Again, by the end of the war, 12 percent of the Union force of the war made up of African Americans. Now, uh, again, when things started going sour in 1864, there were a number of folks who said, "Well, you know, this this emancipation problem, or this emancipation proclamation is a big problem." I've always liked this was Lincoln's response to two Wisconsin Republicans when they the suggestion was that he needed uh, to uh, to uh, pull us back. And he said, you know, if he did this, he would be condemned in time and eternity for doing so. So there was no question, basically, that he was going to hold this. Again, it cost, it cost the Republicans uh, 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 seats, governorships, state legislatures, and the election of 1862. The fact is that once he made the decision, Lincoln stuck to his gun. A little bit on Lincoln and his generals, uh, you know, I mean, these are examples of some of the guys he had to worry about. His biggest, uh, biggest pain and biggest pain was, uh, was George McClellan, 
I'm one of those who believe that McClellan was not so much uh, incompetent as he was, he didn't want to fight Lincoln's war. Uh, he made uh, you know, his argument, he, he was one of those guys who was an advocate of soft work. And a lot of the Union generals were, including Sherman and including, uh, uh, and including Grant at the beginning of the war. What happened is the war proceeded. They figured out that if you're going to win, you actually needed to attack the, the, the Southern social system. And McClellan was the biggest problem. McClellan dragged his feet on a number of occasions. And McClellan uh, basically provided Lincoln in, in uh, June of 18, July of 1862, his plan for fighting the South, which was, you know, just let, let them kind of let them alone. And uh, it was really a really remarkable uh, document in American civil military relations. But he also was making, uh, you know, making uh, threats not only to his wife, but suggesting that he, he, he can put the, his sword across the government. That is, turn the army towards Washington and basically uh, you know, seize the government. When we talk about civil military crises, I think in many cases, 1862, Lincoln himself thought that McClellan might launch a coup. Some of these other guys, I mean, Halleck uh, was, a, was a great, brilliant man, but he was terrible as a general in chief. He acted more like a clerk than anything else. Uh, all these other folks, different times. Uh, George Meade, of course, the situation after Gettysburg. And of course, Grant was his guy, finally. Grant was the guy who moved from being a, basically a brigadier general to a major general, command of an army, command of an, of an army group in the West, to become commander in chief for the first time. Living. Lieutenant General, uh, and uh, to, 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 to then basically uh, become General in Chief. This is a kind of a remarkable letter, and I'm, I'm, I'm tying up here. Uh, uh, Joseph Hooker, when Lincoln chose Hooker to be commander of the Army of the Potomac, he sent him this letter. Now, if you read it, you read down, you know, he's talking about the fact that he had uh, tried to you know, undercut Burnside when he'd been the commander, commanding general of the, of the Army of the Potomac. Look at the bottom there. I have heard, and it's such a way to believe it, of you recently saying that both the Army and the government needed a dictator. Of course, it was not for this, but in spite of it, that I have given you command. <laughs> Only those generals who gain successes can set up dictators. What I now ask of you is military success, and I will risk the dictatorship. Now that's remarkable. Hooker himself said that's the kind of a letter that a father would have sent to a son. So, uh, I mean, uh, Lincoln had to ne negotiate, navigate a lot of, of uh, interesting situations here as leader, from the whole issue of civil liberties to the whole idea of the limits of executive power and uh, what are, in fact, uh, what was the strategy going to be, both in terms of what its objectives were and how it impacted the institute. So with that, I think I've probably gone longer than I'm supposed to. So I'll shut up, and listen to you ask me questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>